Hello everyone, welcome to another edition at the Auto Ninja Academy. This time we're going to be speaking about calcaneal fractures and I've brought with me uh, Amir who's been through uh, with us. Both of us have been doing the foot and ankle module for the last uh, uh, couple of weeks now. So this is going to be an interesting one because we stand uh, pretty much as uh, diametrically opposite to each other on this particular topic. <laughs> Uh, we, do we fix or we leave it alone? That's the big question we're going to be answering. Uh, Amir, I can tell you, is not biased on this. Uh, so we'll see what, he's, uh, what he says when he comes up with his talk. We're going to start off with uh, a case. Okay, so here is a 60-year-old who fell off a ladder 12 foot high. He's got pain, swelling, and he comes into the uh, emergency room. He's got uh, x-rays, which we are seeing now, and uh, he's a smoker. So, uh, Amir, how do we get approach this case? Okay, so he's fallen from a ladder, uh, 12 feet. He's not uh, inconsequential. So I'd start off with the ATLS approach, and I'm going to assume that uh, he doesn't have any other injuries, but I'd be looking for other injuries because so uh, it's an actual loading injury. So things like even tibial plateau fractures, pelvic injuries, uh, the other... Uh, calcaneus, any spinal injuries. Absolutely. So 10% so, uh, of patients with a calcaneal fracture falling from a height, we've got uh, lumbar spine injuries, which we need to look for. So that's uh, the top tip from this history. Okay. So he's a smoker, Amir, and he's 60, which is fairly young. Uh, he's fallen off a ladder. We're going to give him some analgesia and get him home. You know me better than that. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm I'm going to investigate him. Uh, so, so here here are the options. Okay, so we've got a hole out for you as we speak. The question is, should he have a CT scan? So the evidence seems to be quite divided on this. It says calcaneal fractures do no better with surgery. So let's not fix it. Why bother? And he's a smoker, so risks of infection. Your other option is a CT scan may help classify and facilitate open or keyhole reduction. Okay. Primary arthrodesis will give him the best results. So there's no CT required for that. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that last one, but let's see what the audience seems to uh, answer. So Amir, I'd like you to uh, go ahead early on in this talk and pin your colors to the mask. Are you a fixer or not a fixer? So I'm a fixer. So um, there is a significant amount of literature, but like uh, we discussed last week, it, the literature is evolving. We don't actually have any definite rights and wrongs. Um, I think, we had, you know, we we're... 30, 30 years... 40 years worth of literature how much more does it have to evolve now you know technology you know <laughs> um things things are advancing and i think especially over the last 10 years we're getting a much better idea of the way that we should be approaching these injuries um there are lots of ways that lots of means of uh, 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 way approaches to surgery that have been tried before a lot of them have caused a lot of uh, compl complications and we're shying away from them now but that doesn't mean that there aren't more options and technologies helping us with that okay. so let's let's have a look at our uh, responses so uh, there's one person who agrees with you that uh, he's a smoker he's 60 uh, and the risks from surgery are high so shouldn't have a ct scan uh, there is quite a few who want to have him scanned and I must say that's what I would do. I'd want to classify the fracture, whether I, you know, uh, I was going to operate or not. I'd want to know what kind of fracture it was. And primary arthrodesis, I think it's a bit early to be saying uh, that he needs to have an arthrodesis. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, I think, choose I think that we're option. Both, we're both in agreement about getting a CT scan because we want to classify that fracture because uh, that teases out which way we want to head. Now, I think where we will possibly diverge is the method of proceeding thereafter. So after a CT, you're going to fi possibly fix this fracture. That's going to be your default position unless there is something which uh, contraindicates that, correct? Yes. I mean, uh, what we can see from that X-ray is that... Yes, yeah, so uh, talk us through that X-ray. 
Okay, so so I, I can see that the articular surface has been depressed. I can see the articular surface on the talus and the articular surface for on the calcaneus looks like it's about 60 degrees away uh, from it uh, pointing in the wrong direction. So it's been punched down by the talus. And what that means is that I'd be concerned that he doesn't have a congruent articular surface and that's going to give him a high risk of uh, developing uh, degenerative change. And I, I think, you know, we know that people don't do that well from calcaneal fractures, it's one of those injuries where people may have long-term pain and they quite often never go back to their same job, the same job that they had before. This guy was a palada. I don't know what he does for a living. Um, maybe he's a window cleaner or <laughs> possibly. So um, so I'd want to try and get him back to his uh, previous level of function. So I'd, I'd be considering that. Uh, and looking at the type of... Uh, injury with that joint depression I'd want to know what how much uh, of the joint is affected um, and by what degree so that we can plan surgery if that's appropriate okay so for some of our junior surgeons in the audience uh, what Amir is talking about on that x-ray is that double shadow the posterior facet of the calcaneus is pretty much uh, tilted this way uh, by 60 degrees as he's put it okay so let's let's move on so so you got your CT there and uh, do you want to talk us through those uh, images? Okay, so in the left-hand image, we can see that there's been some uh, depression of that uh, joint fragment. It actually doesn't look as bad on this image compared to the plain X-ray, but what we can see is that there's a there's a step uh, in the the joint surface at the uh, just just above the angle of Cassain. And looking at the uh, axial view, it looks like the, there's indeed a step on the articular surface and the chibrosity fragment uh, is uh, more posterior and there's also a fracture of the sustentacular fragment as well. Uh, but the joint surface clearly isn't going to be congruent because of that step on the, the axial. And then on the coronal view, we can see again that the... Um, there's some shortening of the calcaneus and the lateral fragment is depressed and angulated and also the, the lateral wall appears to have been blown out a bit so there's a risk of uh, developing perineal tendon impingement because of that shortening and sort of uh, and uh, widening of the heel okay so just talk us through your thought process as to why you want to fix most of these by default is it you must have some criteria for a calcaneal fracture because i do tend to fix some of these but i have a very narrow uh, criteria for those because i prefer to primarily fuse them uh, delayed now you're going to argue against that and hopefully convince us otherwise but what is your before we get stuck into the gist of the talk itself what is your uh, criteria when you see an x-ray and when you see a ct scan what is going to make you decide that this needs fixation or is it all, all comers get fixed? Well, no, I, I'm I'm quite selective. So I think that if someone has uh, an intraarticular fracture, um, and especially if it's a, uh, it's in there's a two part or a three part fracture, I think those are most amenable to uh, surgery. If it's completely undisplaced um, on the CT scan, then I'm not going to offer the patient surgery. If it's really smashed to smithereens and i don't think in that uh, surgery is going to give them any benefit as in I, I want them to be able to have early range of movement after any operation and if they've got a joint which is so comminuted that it's not going to be feasible for them to be able to move that joint or it's going to be painful um too painful to move then i i'd shy away from trying to operate on them Unless there's some additional benefit, like um, trying to get the bony uh, uh, components in a position that might make it easier for me to do a fusion later on. Uh, but what about looking, what about, yeah, go on, sorry. But looking at uh, this, it looks like it's uh, the articular surface of the posterior facet is split in two, mm -hmm. and I think that that's something that's amenable to a simple intervention that might 
uh, allow uh, correction. What about things like workers' compensation and smoking? Would that make you think, hang on, you know what, I'm going to leave this patient alone, let them gum up, and then give them one uh, one surgery, predictable surgery, such as a fusion? Or would you still, in those cases, go in and try to rectify the uh, anatomy? So workers' compensation is associated with a poorer result. Um, but um, what's uh, probably more associated with a poorer result is uh, a non-congruent joint. And if he's a smoker, that would certainly put me off doing an extended lateral approach because I'd be concerned that he would have soft tissue issues. Um, but I am a keyhole uh, surg surgery person, so even in a smoker, uh, I'd be quite happy to use keyhole surgery because I think I can manipulate that back to a decent position. So if we want to get give one top take home message today, right at the outset to uh, our colleagues and our audience, extensile lateral approach is a no, no. Would you agree or disagree? I think, I think certainly for this patient, it's a no, no. Um, okay. There are some people who, um, will swear by that approach and say that in their hands it works. Um, I've used that approach previously, but it's not my choice, not my favoured choice for um, calcaneal fracture surgery now. And the literature doesn't seem to back up the use of an extensile lateral approach, does it? With regards I think to it's, complications it, and morbidity associated with it? It it's have a lot of complications, but um, again, there's no black and white in the literature. It's not absolutely clear that it's the approach uh, that that is the problem. It may be uh, our surgical lack of preparation. There may be other factors at play. Um, but in general, I think everybody is shying away from the extended uh, lateral approach now. OK, great. Let's see where we are at. Yeah, so here's a man after my own heart. The CT has just costed money. <laughs> Uh, we knew there was a depression there, okay? You're just getting it in a 3D format now. Your options are that the extended lateral approach is still possible. Yes, there are risks, but we take those risks. Keyhole surgery is possible and the risks are minimal. This is unfixable uh, in a smoker, so fusion is the best option in uh, a few months. Hmm. So, so here is a, a poll going out to our audience. Let's see where they are at. So I take it you're, you've already said you're going to be fixing this, correct? Yes. So uh, I'm going through those options, um, I've, I've decided already it's displaced. He's likely to get poor result from conservative treatment. The extended lateral approach, I'd be very reticent about doing it, uh, especially in somebody who's 60 and a smoker. I don't think the risks are acceptable. Uh, keyhole surgery is my uh, choice of... Uh, treatment for most people and uh, unfixable in a smoker fusion yeah, fusion is is an option I think that's not an unreasonable way to approach it in somebody who's 60 uh, and a smoker and you've got to give the patient all the different options and uh, give them the choice basically okay so I've got I've got a disclaimer here uh, Amir taught me um, the percutaneous approach he's he's a he's a great uh, He's got lots of skills when it comes to percussion expectation of these uh, fractures. But I'm going to push you here, Amir, okay? Because uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate and push you here. He's 60. He's a smoker, okay? Are you in agreement that the die was cast at the time of the injury? That, that cartilage has been damaged to a large extent. So he is going to have stiffness and possibly traumatic arthritis no matter what we do. Are we in agreement there? I think that stiffness is uh, stiffness is contributed to not just by the injury but also by our treatment and rehabilitation so one of the main aims of um, surgery if you look at the AO principles are that you anatomically reduce you get rigid fixation and you aim for early mobilization and uh, so I, I, I still believe in that and I think believe that if we can fix them rigidly and we can start early passive mobilization, then we can actually avoid stiffness. It may be that if the damage to the joint surface is so severe, they may develop degenerative change, but 
we know from lots of uh, there's lots of evidence from different joints that the more anatomical uh, the reduction is, the less likely it is that someone is going to develop uh, post-traumatic arthritis. So you're, you're swinging, swinging the uh, audience there. But there is enough evidence to suggest that at the time of injury, damage occurs to the uh, chondrocytes and the cartilage, which That's undoubted. traumatic yes. arthritis no matter what yes. we try to do, correct? And so you, this, you can, so you can develop guess, chondrolysis. Yes, right. as a yes. result of so that. So here's my question to you. Why put this gentleman through two operations? Because he is going to need a fusion at some point in the future, more than likely. We can't say for sure, but more than likely. So why not just let him gum up, go in maybe 12 weeks down the line and fix him, or fuse him, sorry. Because you're giving him one procedure. It's a predictable operation. Uh, and as you rightly put it, I appreciate when the when the uh, joint is not completely trashed and the anatomy is not distorted, it's probably worth just fusing. In the joints where the anatomy is completely distorted and trashed, then yes, percutaneous fixation comes into its own to try to just get it back into some semblance of normalcy so it makes your fusion easier at a later stage. So why not just go ahead and give him a fusion at a later stage now when that joint's not too bad? Because the evidence in the literature says otherwise that actually the rate of subtalar fusion that's required for patients, especially who have uh, keyhole reduction, is incredibly low. And even in some of the big papers that we're going to talk about, the, looking at the rate of fusion for conservatively treated versus surgically treated patients, the rate of subtalar arthrodesis is lower in those that are treated initially with surgery. So there is some advantage. Okay, so I'm sure you're going to try to convince us through the course of uh, your talk on this, and I look forward to that. So here is it. He would like to know his options to maintain movement. So you tell him open surgery with extended lateral approach for an anatomic reduction, arthroscopic assisted reduction, or indirect reduction with the sexlopresti uh, maneuvers. Okay, so let's see. This is your post following MIS surgery, right? This is one of your cases. Yeah. You want to talk us, talk us through this uh, approach? I'm sure you need to talk okay, so we'll, through this, but just briefly. We're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna go through the approach, but um, what I'm hoping uh, I'll be able to do is to convince you that this kind of approach is something that is reproducible and uh, is reliable. And especially if you use uh, an arthroscope, you can see the articular surface and it's possible to reduce things to uh, a level that even with open surgery, you, you might not be able to achieve. I mean, so if you look that's at... That's beautifully re reduced. I mean, I mean you're, we're matching up the uh, pre and post-op images one next to the other, and you've got a fantastic anatomic reduction there. Yeah, and but this is not a flash in the pan. This is something that is reproducible. So it's it's something that we, you know, if with the, the correct amount of consideration and preparation, you can achieve this for most patients. Yeah. So hopefully we're going to learn that technique from you through the course of this talk. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to you for uh, the talk on uh, calculating of fractures. It's a shame that patient landed up in my clinic six months later for a fusion. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. So on, over, over to you, mate. let's, thanks very much. So um, it's always good to have a, have a chat with Raheel because, uh, you know, there isn't all, only one way of doing things. And it's important that you appreciate that uh, there are different opinions and in the literature, there are different ideas about how you can do things. And uh, especially in orthopedics, the, the quality of the literature isn't that great. And you need to be able to uh, critique the literature so that you can discern what is what you feel is right and what's going to work for your patients. So we're going to talk uh, about calcaneal fractures and the uh, subject matter that I'm going to talk through. I'm going to start off with the epidemiology. We're going to talk about the anatomy of the calcaneus uh, because that's obviously very important in uh, the way that it breaks and what you're trying to put together. We're going to go through classifications. Now, classifications in orthopedics may not be incredibly helpful for determining the management, but it does mean that we can compare like with like 
if we uh, are looking at papers, we want to know what kind of uh, uh, comminution uh, there is in each uh, particular group of patients. Uh, and I think classifications are very good for that. They can also help you to decide what kind of uh, treatment uh, may be appropriate for the patient. We'll do a little bit about clinical assessment, but usually this is something that's very uh, uh, obvious and apparent. We'll go through what imaging uh, uh, is required for um, planning a patient's treatment. And then we'll go through the surgical techniques. And when we go through the surgical techniques, I want to try to present um, as broad a range of techniques as possible. So I'm going to talk to you about techniques that you know, I may have given up uh, already, um, but which are important for you to know about. And then we're going to talk about outcomes. And again, although I have my own preferences for how I would treat um, uh, calcaneal fractures, I'm going to try to talk about outcomes with different techniques and go through the literature and then try and sum up about whether we should fix uh, and if we are going to fix, how are we going to fix it and when are we going to fix it. I'm going to try and give you an algorithm which might aid you in sort of your decision making as well. So, first of all, you know, fractures affecting the hind foot, it's the most common. So it's about uh, 60 to 70 percent of tarsal fractures and it's 2% of all uh, fractures that present to you. So that's 11.5 per 100,000 of the population. And it seems to be men that are affected more than women. And that's often uh, associated with uh, employment. Uh, and the vast majority of them involve falling from a height. And that may be uh, as low as a few feet, but quite often it's uh, our patients will have fallen from more than 12 feet. And that's something that we need to take very seriously because that's uh, now a high energy trauma. So it's important to know about the anatomy of uh, the calcaneus. Uh, and we'll start off in the bottom uh, left hand corner. So we've got the uh, tuberosity uh, of the calcaneus at the back and we've got the sustentaculum tailor. And the sustentaculum is basically where the, the talus is sitting on top on the medial side. If we then go to the uh, top uh, left picture, you can see the articular facets on the calcaneus. And the one that we're mainly interested in is the posterior facet, which is the, the big one that uh, articulates with the posterior facet of the talus. But also there's a middle and an anterior facet as well. And there's a large area which is non-articular. And then if we go down to uh, the bottom right, you can, uh, on the other side of the uh, calcaneus, on the lateral side, there's the anterior process of the uh, calcaneus and the sinus tarsi uh, um, sitting between the calcaneus and the uh, uh, talus uh, anteriorly. And you've got the tuberosity of the calcaneus posteriorly. Now, I think what's really important to understand is that this is not just a fracture. It's not just affecting one system. So, yes, there's a bony injury. The, the calcaneus is broken, but the calcaneus is mostly uh, trabecular bone. It's, it's cancellous and that is going to heal up. What we're more concerned about is the articular injury. So the articular injury to the posterior facet and to the calcaneus cuboid joint and you know, sometimes even the syntaculum as well. And then we also need to think about the soft tissue injury. So the heel fat pad um, is often pulverized. If, you know, if, if enough force has gone through this body to break the heel bone, then just think about what's happened to the uh, more friable fat pad underneath the heel, which acts as a shock absorber, and that's going to be pulverized. And quite often patients complain of pain underneath their heel in the fat pad for a year or so after their injury. So that's a significant component as well. Now, when you're looking at x-rays, you need to know about Bowler's angle and Gassane's angle. So Bowler's angle is uh, a line, it's an angle subtended by the line joining the, uh, the, the most superior part of the uh, calcaneus at its posterior aspect and the top of the uh, posterior facet. 
and then the second line for bellows angle is between the, the top of the posterior facet and the top of the anterior facet. That's normally between 20 and 40 degrees. And there's Gazane's angle, which is formed by the posterior facet coming down to meet uh, a line joining the bottom of the posterior facet with the anterior um, uh, uh, process of the calcaneus. And that should be between 130 and 145 degrees. And quite often on x-ray, you will see an area which looks a little bit empty, and that's called a neutral triangle because of the paucity of trabeculae. So, as I've said before, this is a, an axial loading injury, but the talus is sitting on the cystentaculum. So if you look at the right-hand picture, you'll see that when you land, essentially there's a shearing force, and that shearing force, uh, as the calcaneus is being pushed up by the ground reaction, and the weight of the body is pushing down, and there's a shearing force across, across the uh, calcaneus, and that tends to cause a primary fracture line. That primary fracture line will be sort of anterior and lateral and posterior and medial, and it will go across the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. That's our primary, facet, uh, primary fracture line. But then there will also be secondary fracture lines, and these will come off from the primary fracture line. And if the secondary uh, fracture line exits from the superior surface of the calcaneus, then we end up with a joint depression type fracture. And if the uh, secondary fracture line exits from the posterior surface of the calcaneus, then we end up with a tongue type fracture because the superior fragment is all one piece. And uh, that's reflected in uh, one of the classifications. So Essex lepresti uh, can either be, uh, you can either divide them into extra articular fractures or intra articular fractures. So, the extra articular fractures, which are the minority of things like the anterior process of the calcaneus, cystentacular fractures, perineal tubercle fractures, tuberosity fractures, like that picture on the left, which doesn't go into the joints at all, and uh, TA avulsion fractures. Now, TA avulsion fractures can be a problem because the avulsed fragment does cause a lot of pressure on the skin and if it's left there it can cause necrosis of the skin which is a nightmare uh, and you need the plastic surgeons to cover that up for you so that's actually something that needs to be dealt with urgently and then the second type of uh, essex lepresti fracture is the intraarticular group and the intraarticular group uh, can be either centrally depressed if the fracture, the secondary fracture line comes out from the top, or it can be a tongue type uh, when it, the fracture exits from the back. Now, the other classification that you'll have heard of is Sanders classification, and this is based uh, on CT, and you need to look at semi-coronal -re reconstructions. Now, quite often, we don't get semi-coronal reconstructions, and we just go off on the axial because that's the uh, uh, series that we get from uh, the CT scan. And uh, the classification really depends on the number of fragments in that important posterior facet and then whereabouts uh, in that posterior facet the fracture lines are. So you can have a, a one part fracture which sounds a bit illogical but essentially it means that it's completely undisplaced uh, and those are the types of fractures that you could treat conservatively. Then you can have two or three part fractures, depending on where the fracture lines are. And this is type four, where essentially you've got a mushed up joint surface, uh, which is not reconstructable. And here's a demonstration. So we've got uh, uh, the semi-coronal uh, CT there. We can see the posterior facet. And if you look at the images on the right, you can see we're, we're looking at essentially the same kind of uh, section and um, the uh, C-type uh, injury goes through uh, just next to the cystentaculum tali, and the A-type goes uh, more laterally, and the B is somewhere in between. So we're looking at that uh, axial, and we're essentially looking for those lines to try to uh, classify with uh, Sanders. If you're going to assess the patient, you're always going to start with ATLS because 
it's a high energy injury to uh, break the calcaneus and you need to be aware that other injuries may have occurred and exclude these. Quite typically, the patient's fallen from a height, you know, most commonly it's a ladder. Um, we sometimes refer to these as the, the lover's fracture, um, where someone's jumped off a balcony, or a burglar's fracture, where uh, someone's jumped off a, a balcony after they've been um, burgling someone's house. We need to know if the patient's smoking, and we need to know what kind of work that they do. And when you're examining the patient, uh, you need to be wary about compartment syndrome and uh, examine them for tenderness, bruising, swelling and uh, fracture blisters as well. If you're going to image the patient, uh, normally we get a lateral of the ankle and then we try to get an axial. And in order to get an axial, you need to have the beam tilted about 30 or 40 degrees. Uh, but uh, and this can give you a decent image and it might be able to show you the subtalar joint, but it's often quite painful uh, for the patient to have an axial that uh, shows the, um, the posterior facet. So it's, it's not always a, an, impor an, an important investigation. And I pretty much always uh, ask for a CT scan. And it's going to allow us to classify it. And it's going to help us decide, is this an intraarticular fracture? Because those are the ones that uh, really need uh, to be fixed if uh, there's displacement of the joint. We can also identify sort of key structures uh, um, that might be important for our surgery. So as I said before, you know, this isn't a black and white issue and there's a role for all different types of management and we need to be able to make a decision based on the evidence. So, you know, you can treat some things conservatively. So if it's a stress fracture, if it's undisplaced. Um, some people would argue that if a patient smokes, then they shouldn't have surgery. Some people would argue that if it's communist, they shouldn't have surgery. And some people would argue that all calcaneal fractures shouldn't have surgery. But that's something that's still very controversial. So let's uh, have a look at the extended lateral approach. Um, this approach basically um, uh, is going to you, uh, develop a flap uh, on the lateral calcaneal artery and we shouldn't be operating on a patient with this approach uh, uh, soon after their injury because there's a lot of soft tissue damage and you want to wait for the swelling to settle down. So the people who do this generally wait uh, for 10 to 14 days and you can see in that right hand image what I'm doing is uh, I'm just giving the foot a little bit of a twist and there's some wrinkling of the skin and the wrinkling of the skin essentially tells me that um, the swelling is on its way down. We're going to put the patient in a lateral uh, position and we want to uh, be able to get three different types of x-ray. A lateral view, uh, a broken view which is externally rotated at 45 degrees and an axial view as well. Using this approach um, we uh, are able to draw up this full thickness flap and uh, the idea is that you get down to bone and you stay on bone. So the lateral calcaneal artery is somewhere in that flap and you're, not, you're going to try to um, avoid injuring that because that's going to keep the flap alive. And the cereal nerve is also in that flap and we need to avoid that. But necessarily we're going to uh, injure the calcaneal fibula ligament. Once that approach has been used, um, a it's possible. To you here, Amir. Yes, of course. Uh, how how often have you used this extensile approach? Because uh, it's right through my training. I've I've probably seen this thrice because more and more people have decided to either fix percutaneously or um, leave them alone. So how often have you seen this? Is this because uh, with with new surgeons coming through training now a lot a lot less of this approach is being done particularly in the west so and, and absolutely I, I don't use this approach anymore um i did use this approach all the way through my training and um for the first couple of years uh, as a consultant and i'm going to show you a case a little bit later, later on which is one of my disasters 
and that is going to be the explanation as to why I stopped using this approach. Uh, but there are still people who swear by this approach. Uh, and so it, it is something that you will come across, um, perhaps less so uh, in the West, but it's still practiced quite widely. And uh, the way that when, once the flap's been elevated, um, what you can do is use K wires to prevent the flap from dropping back into your operative field. So the K wires go into the uh, they go into the talus, and then uh, you bend them 90 degrees so that they're holding the flap, uh, and you can see the subtalar joint, uh, but the K wires are not going to get in your way. And uh, these images basically show three different views. So we've got an axial on the right hand side. We've got a Broden view, which is uh, uh, looking straight down the posterior facet by putting the foot into 45 degrees of external rotation and a normal lateral view. And you can see the plate that's been used um, and that plate you can put directly onto bone uh, because you've essentially flayed the entire calcaneus. You've exposed the whole bone. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I'm not very happy with the approach as well. So actually the reduction is straightforward. You can see everything. It's quite reliable in being able to uh, re reduce those fragments anatomically. Um, and that's what you'd expect with such a large approach uh, because you can see everything. So this is one of my patients. And I think this is from uh, about 10 years ago. Right here. So this is the reason that I stopped doing the extended lateral approach. And I'm not the only person who's had this problem. Uh, you know, the patient waited uh, 10 days from the time of his injury. He His wrinkling uh, had appeared, so I thought that I was safe. Uh, but uh, clearly uh, the flap uh, uh, is dying, the skin is dying, there's a lot of necrosis there. And this is something that's going to need uh, um, a free flap in order to cover this up now. So it's a, a disaster for the patient um, because they're now going to have even more surgery. And it's a disaster for me because um, I don't want to have to put my patients through this because I know that uh, if they have a free flap, it's going, they're going to be disabled uh, because of the amount of soft tissue that's going to go onto that. They're going to find it difficult to get into shoes for the next year. So uh, this is something that we need to try to avoid. And uh, as I said, you know, there are people who still uh, use this approach and they have arguments as to why they do that. So in, if you look in the literature, about 25% uh, of patients have wound problems of one type or another. You can see that on the, these two images that are on the right, they're from a, uh, someone else's paper. And you can see that there's some necrosis in the top uh, image and there's exposed metal um, on the, um, the, the bottom image. And it's relying on a branch of the uh, lateral calcaneal artery to keep that flap alive. We don't know whether that flap may have been injured um, as part of the soft tissue injury. Now, this is uh, a paper which um, actually uh, throw some doubt as, uh, on uh, those of us who are not keen on the uh, that particular approach. Uh, they've looked at 90 fractures and what they've done is they've actually identified five uh, patients who didn't have a Doppler signal from their lateral calcaneal artery and the other 85 they did have a signal and what they found was that um, the ones who didn't have a signal all had wound problems, but the ones who did have a signal, only one out of the 85, so that's 1%, had uh, soft tissue uh, uh, wound problems. So it may be predictable whether people are going to have uh, issues, but I'm still very doubtful, uh, despite this paper, because I've looked at lots of other studies and each one of them from quite reputable authors have said that they've had about a one in four uh, rate of wound problems. So and the, and the question this may you, you, you've yes. got to ask the question if you can get a fairly reproducible uh, congruent joint without flaying open that foot why do this? 
Absolutely, absolutely. I, 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 I can see the, the merit of their paper, but as I'm in uh, the majority of uh, surgeons who have found that there are soft tissue issues with a lot of these patients who've had an extended lateral approach, I won't use this approach again. And, you know, it, even if you uh, can get an anatomical reduction, as you say, you know, there might be some chondrolysis because of the injury itself. So there's still a risk of post-traumatic uh, arthritis. We know that it's related to how well you reduce the, the uh, uh, joint uh, surface fragments. The lateral wall blowout can lead to impingement of the perineal tendons, and that might be another reason to go back in and operate on the patients. So what I'm trying to say uh, uh, in this talk is that the extended lateral approach does give you fantastic vision and you can reduce everything anatomically. But are you helping the patient if you've given them a second massive soft tissue injury? And that soft tissue injury is associated with pain and stiffness and you know, a lot of swelling. So it's preventing the early mobilization, which I think is important for uh, managing these particular injuries. So um, let's talk about Buckley's paper, because this is, uh, if you're going into the, any exam, this is one that you need to know about. A lot of people quote it, and it's a paper from Canada uh, from uh, four different centres, and they took 424 patients and they uh, uh, randomised them to uh, uh, conservative or operative treatment using that uh, extended lateral approach and they looked at lots of different variables to uh, assess if uh, there had been um, uh, any difference between the two and what they decided was that actually there wasn't any difference in the outcomes between the operative and the non-operative group but obviously uh, there was a difference in, the, in terms of the number of complications uh, because of the surgery so um, this paper is cited by many people as being justification for not operating on calcaneal fractures however it's this is why critiquing in uh, papers is important because there are lots of buts if you look into the paper in a bit more detail you find that there are some groups who did benefit from surgery so younger patients seem to do better than the non-operative uh, group the, uh, if it, for women and patients who are not on a workers' compensation scheme. Another criticism of this paper is that uh, they asked each centre to recruit 20, but actually one centre and one surgeon operated on the vast majority of the patients uh, in this study. And their power calculation may have been flawed, so they actually needed three times as many patients in order to be able to demonstrate a difference if a difference existed between these two uh, groups. There were quite a few patients who um, were not recruited or lost a follow-up who had calcaneal fractures. And what's interesting is that there was a difference in the requirement for subtalar effusion. So patients who had um, surgical treatment of their calcaneal fracture there was a statistically significant difference in that they needed subtalar fusion less than the patients who'd been treated conservatively. The second paper that you need to be able to quote in an exam is Griffin. Uh, so Griffin et al uh, produced their paper, it was, it was called the UK HEAL trial. Again, a multi-centre trial. Um, it uh, was published in 2014 and they only had 151 patients in the trial. And again, they decided that uh, there was no difference in the outcome between conservative and operative treatments. And obviously, if you have an operation, you're gonna have some complications from that. So they said there were more complications from the operative group. But again, if you look at that a little bit more closely, there are uh, some questions that have to be asked. So. The, the two groups, their operative and non-operative group, weren't really comparable because their operative group had a much higher number of smokers. They only followed the patients up for a, a few years, so they couldn't actually tell us what the rate of subtalar fusion uh, was like. And actually, subtalar fusion 
it, with, if you have early surgery, that means that if you do have to have a subtalar fusion, it's a little bit easier because all the bone fragments are in the right position. They were satisfied with a less than perfect reduction, which is something that perhaps most of us wouldn't be uh, for a calcaneal fracture. And the other very odd thing about this study is that there were 2006 um, patients who were enrolled, of which they felt only 502 met their inclusion criteria, and then only 151 were finally included in their study. And a lot of their exclusion criteria were a little bit bizarre. So they uh, said that if the patient had fibular impingement, then they would oper they would take them out of the study and they would automatically get operations. If the fracture was very commuted or grossly displaced, then they wouldn't um, randomise the patient. They'd say, well, they, they clearly needed to have surgery because it was grossly displaced. So it actually narrows down the uh, patients who were included in this study to patients who were uh, essentially uh, in an equivocal group who may or may not have, uh, may not need uh, to have surgery. So it, it, it's by taking out the patients who are uh, definitely going to be treated conservative and definitely need to have surgery, it actually means that it's difficult to know whether their power cal calculation was correct. But wouldn't you argue, Amir, that that's a perfectly reasonable uh, in indication for fixing? Because although I don't fix, I have a narrow indication, as I said, one of my indications to fix a calcaneal fra uh, fracture would be fibula uh, impingement due to a lateral wall blowout. Mm. So but in, in, in terms of a trial, if you uh, want to compare patients who have uh, uh, and identify if surgery is uh, beneficial, then actually, if you've got fibular impingement or gross displacement, then surgery would benefit that patient Correct. quite markedly. So why remove them from the trial? Um, you know, if you're going to randomise all calcaneal fractures to uh, operative and non-operative, why remove you know an important group of patients from the trial? So yeah, that that's what I'm querying. Uh, there are lots of uh, reasons that um, you know, we could um, question this trial uh, and there are arguments both ways. I'm sure there are uh, answers to some of the questions that I've uh, have, I've raised. Um, and, but and we know this this trial changed practice in England, don't we? Significantly. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So, MJ, yeah. yeah, so so, uh, so many people um, uh, change their practice on the basis of, of this so that less people are practicing calcaneal fracture surgery now than were 10 years ago. But those are only two papers and there are a lot of other papers. Uh, so there are at least eight good randomized controlled trials. And what's useful is to try to pool all the patients from these uh, different trials. So um, what we can see uh, from uh, two similar papers which uh, reviewed all of the trials and pooled the patients um, can be summarized with these forest plots. So uh, if you look at the uh, top right forest plot, this is um, looking at whether it's beneficial for patients to have surgery and their likelihood of returning to their pre-injury work. And the forest plot shows that quite obviously, patients who have had surgery are more likely to return to work doing the job that they did prior to their injury. If you look at the middle uh, forest plots on the right, you can see this is a, a looking at residual pain. And the forest plot demonstrates that those patients who've had surgery are in a lot less pain than those patients who were treated conservatively. And if you look at the bottom forest plot, looking at uh, patients' comfort in wearing shoes, what we can see is that the forest plot quite markedly demonstrates that those patients who are treated operatively are more comfortable wearing shoes compared to those patients who were treated conservatively. Now, that th these are all nuances of, of the, uh, the trials that um, I think are quite important. But if you look at the forest plot on the left hand side, this is looking at uh, the American Orthopaedic Foot and Ankle Society score, the AOFAS score, which 
we, is something that's quite used quite widely to uh, judge the outcomes uh, from studies. And interestingly, the AOFAS score overall seems to favour non-operative treatment. But those three uh, uh, score, the uh, three forest plots on the right, would seem to suggest that actually there is some benefit for the patient, even if you consider that that on the the score on the scoring system, uh, it's uh, possibly not so beneficial for the patient. But there's some real uh, issues like going back to work and being in pain that are important for patients. And my view uh, of uh, these uh, RCTs is that we're comparing two different options, both of which may have a, a poor result. So conservative treatment we know uh, overall is going to cause a poor result. And the extended lateral approach, because of the amount of soft tissue problems associated with it, is also likely to cause a poor result. So we're comparing hanging against the electric chair. We're comparing two bad options. So what we really need is to be able to compare conservative treatment against other surgical options. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about later. So the other options are minimally invasive surgery. And there are different techniques. Uh, so there's the Essex Lepresti technique, which is the entirely percutaneous technique. There's a, a mini open approach, which uh, goes in through the sinus tarsi rather than uh, the extended lateral approach and there's an arthroscopic assisted reduction uh, which I'm going to show you a little bit later. So this is uh, one of my patients um, we're uh, performing uh, an Essex Lepresti uh, reduction. Uh, we need three different views so we need a lateral, the patient's in a lateral position, um, we have to have the uh, x-ray source under the table and the intensifier, uh, the screen on top uh, so that we can get a decent view and we can uh, see a, a true lateral of the foot uh, and we can also extenuate the foot 45 degrees to get the Broden view and then it's put if you extenuate the knee and you dorsiflex the foot and you tilt the uh, image intensifier as I've shown in that image it's possible to then get a, a good axial of the calcaneus and see the subtalar joint. So you can see the articular surface of that posterior facet. Once we've identified the anatomy, you can see uh, in this uh, image intensifier film that there's a fragment which has been depressed. I'm going to use um, some uh, uh, Steinman pins to go underneath that fragment. And the, the pins are introduced either side of the Achilles tendon, and then they're pushed uh, by hand, not by power, underneath that uh, fragment. And in order to identify which direction to go, you need to have a look at the CT. You get unto, under the anterior aspect of that fragment, and then we're going to start levering on that fragment. Now, unfortunately, that image isn't very good, but you can see the two pins in the, the X-ray uh, image on top. And in the image below, you can see the two pins which are converging on the fragment that I'm interested in. And I'm going to pull down on those pins and at the same time I'm going to pull the foot down. And looking at the image intensifier you'll be able to see the reduction. It's uh, a risky procedure because you only really get one or two shots and if you uh, don't get a good purchase in the bone then what can happen is that uh, you can fragment the surface even more. But um, when we watch the video, you can see that we have to bend the pins quite uh, markedly in order to... Um, in order to uh, use the Essex Lepresti uh, technique, you need the patient in a lateral position. A pin needs to be put in next to the Achilles tendon. And these two pins will converge underneath the uh, segment to be elevated. It needs quite a lot of force. As you can see, the, these are 5mm pins and they're bending quite a lot. If you look underneath the two pins, you'll be able to see a white space. And this is where the bone originally started from. This space will fill in automatically and there's no need to bone graft. 
as we're lifting up we can see how the joint is now congruent again and the angle of Gassane has been restored. Okay, so I hope that video gave you a good demonstration of exactly how the surgery is performed. So we're just levering up um, almost like a seesaw. You're, you uh, are, so we pull down at the back. Uh, you are plantar flexing that foot to relax the Achilles tendon, correct? To to get that maneuver. Easy. Yes, that's right. Yes. So, so the knee's normally a bit bent as well. Right. So. So for fixation, once you've um, managed to reduce those fragments, it's important to hold them in that position. And the way that we're going to do that is by uh, putting in some percutaneous screws. Uh, the styling pins uh, are going to be uh, uh, keeping the reduction. And then going to transfix the um, articular surface by using um, uh, some KYs through the heel that go through the calcaneus and into the talus and those will then hold everything in the right position and then I can replace the Simon pins with some uh, fully threaded screws like this and they're acting as raft screws so they're preventing that fragment from then falling back down again at the same time uh, we need to keep the articular surface as compressed together as possible so I put some screws in uh, from the lateral side aiming towards the sustentaculum uh, so that uh, I can compress the articular surface and I should be able to avoid going uh, into the articular surface when I do that. This is uh, the sinus tarsi approach so it's uh, starting uh, uh, the incision starts at the uh, tip of the fibula and it goes down to the uh, fourth uh, metatarsal base so that's a conventional utility approach that we use for subtalar fusion. And through this approach, you can see the lateral fragment and you can put uh, an elevator in and lift up the lateral fragment that's been depressed in the angle of Gassane. And um, you can uh, uh, um, also put an instrument in to try to uh, decrease the overlap between the sustentaculum and the main part of the, the calcaneus. And this has got a little plate, uh, which is designed for the sinus tarsi approach. We just share, and this we is just a, another- the audience a sorry. handout on versus the minimally invasive uh, approach uh, paper, just so the audience is aware. Sorry to interrupt, please. Okay. okay, and this is just another approach. So. Here we've got a patient who's got a commuted articular surface and what I've uh, the four images on the top right are, are mine and what I've done is I've uh, introduced an arthroscope from uh, posterior so the patient's in a prone position. I've put that arthroscope down the back of the posterior facet and that's allowed me to see the articular surface and it's possible to see the three pieces of the articular surface. Now um, uh, what I've done then is uh, to put in a uh, threaded guide wire and you can see that in the, the group of four pictures on the bottom left, uh, bottom right, you can see something shiny and that's actually a 3.2 millimetre guide wire and I can then lift up uh, the fragment uh, under direct vision and that allows me to then reduce that pretty much anatomically and then in the same way that with the uh, Essex Lepressi technique, I'd put in some percutaneous uh, screws. I've done exactly the same uh, for that patient. And you can see the, the final result uh, in the bottom left hand corner. So you can see that the articular surface, uh, uh, the middle third, which was depressed, has now been uh, elevated back up again. So what we need to decide really is uh, is percutaneous surgery any better than open surgery? Um, is primary fusion an option for severely damaged joints? And of all those different techniques, which is better? 
percutaneous surgery or sinus tarsi, mini open incisions, or the arthroscopic assisted. And that's what we need to look into the literature for. So we can't actually say that percutaneous surgery is any better than any other type of approach. But there are more and more studies coming out uh, which are showing the advantages of this approach. So uh, there's two papers uh, on the right. The bottom one is from that man Buckley, who uh, uh, was responsible for the Canadian study. And um, uh, I think it's really interesting. We, we were talking before about the rates of subtalar arthrodesis, uh, Rahil. Chen's paper in 2010 using a keyhole technique, um, they found that 132 of their 210 patients returned to their original work at only five months post-op, which I think is remarkable. They had um, about 10% who had radiological osteoarthritis, but only four of their 200, uh, two, four of their 156 patients were actually symptomatic from their arthritis, and not a single patient had actually undergone a subtalar arthrodesis. Uh, and the papers from China are actually very useful because they are massive numbers. They're numbers that we just would not be able to achieve in the West uh, without having large um, multi-centre trials. But in China, there seem to be trials which uh, are recruiting enormous numbers of patients, which is very useful for uh, being able to work out the science of whether it's um, uh, an advantageous approach. So is few primary fusion an option? Well, um, there are again papers uh, which demonstrate that, uh, in fact, if you fuse someone primarily, their outcome isn't really that much better than if they have open reduction internal fixation. I suppose the advantage of fusing someone primarily is that they only have one operation instead of two, but the rates of arthrodesis are actually quite small. So it may be possible that, you know, uh, 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 immediate fusion is jumping the gun a little bit. Um, and the, there are no downsides uh, to fusion compared to open reduction. Uh, but it makes you wonder about uh, if you do open and reduce, are you improving the position of the bone so that it, if you do have to do a fusion later on, it's going to be easier? Um, so there are lots of questions that still remain unanswered. Um, so this is how I make my decisions. It's not, it's just one way of doing it. I'm not saying this is the only way of doing it. So if I've got a calcaneal fracture, if it's extra articular, I'd be concerned. If it's a TA avulsion, that needs to be urgently reduced and fixed. So I put a big clamp on that, bring the fragment down and put some percutaneous screws through it. If it's extra articular, and it's not involving uh, the Achilles tendon, then I'm going to treat that conservatively. If it's an intraarticular fracture, I think it really depends on your skill set. If you've got uh, a Sanders 1, so an undisplaced fracture, then you can treat that conservatively. If you've got a Sanders 4, so it's one where the joint surface has been pulverised, um, if they're a smoker, then I'd be very reluctant to do anything to them and I'd treat them conservatively and I'd offer them a late fusion, uh, but I'd try to get them to stop smoking first. If they're not a smoker and they have a pulverized joint, then I think uh, offering them a primary fusion is not unreasonable. Um, the area where there's most controversy still is really in the Sanders two and three. So if they're a tongue type, I will always use the Essex Lepresti technique because I've seen in the literature a lot of people using the uh, mini open technique and plating for uh, the tongue type. I really don't feel that's necessary because we can get such reliable, uh, good results with uh, tongue type uh, using the Essex Lepresti technique. For the central depression uh, fragments, again, you, I think that surgical intervention is helpful, but whether Essex Lepresti or sinus tarsi approach or an arthroscopic assisted approach is the best. Um, means of uh, giving uh, the patient a reduced joint. I don't know, and there's no 
uh, clear evidence in the literature to say that one way is any better than the other. But I'm hoping that's something that's going to become more clear with time as more studies get published. So in summary, we've gone through the epidemiology, we've talked about the anatomy of the calcaneus, we've talked about the classifications and what use they are, we've talked about the cert different surgical techniques, and we've been through the literature to try to decide should we be fixing fractures, if we are going to fix them, how are we going to fix them, when we're going to fix them. And I think it's just important to remember it's a multi-system injury, so it's not just the bone, the bone will heal up. But as Raheel pointed out you know, uh, at the beginning, it's what happens to the joint. If you have chondrolysis, then that means that they're going to end up having an arthrodesis. And also think about the soft tissues uh, in the heel fat pad, and fat pad underneath, because those have been pulverized and they're going to cause pain no matter how you treat them. Even if you get an absolutely anatomical result, they're going to carry on having heel fat pad pain for a year. Uh, and that's the end of the talk, Rahil. Thank you very much. That was a very uh, informative talk, and uh, I think uh, all of us have learned quite a bit. Uh, I can totally vouch for that project in the which I learned off you. It seems to be a bit of uh, grand noise there. Uh, it's, as you say rightly, it's re uh, re reproducible and it works pr almost all the time as long as you get your specs right. Uh, in summary, top three take home points. Uh, Amir, do you want to just summarize before we uh, ask the audience if they've got any questions? If you've got any questions, please, please feel free to use the chat uh, box. We will answer your questions now. Uh, but I'll let uh, Amir summarize with his top three take home messages. So what I say is that, um, first of all, uh, it's a serious injury and it causes long term morbidity uh, and interferes with people's lives because it, it stops them from working. It, you need to be sure that it's an isolated injury, not part of um, uh, a, a pattern of injury from actual loading. So you need to go through ATLS. And the third point is that the literature still isn't abundantly clear. And don't just take one or two papers and make your conclusions from those papers. I think you need to read quite widely in order to un, uh, sort of appreciate the, the subtleties um, uh, uh, that uh, can be drawn, especially from the systematic reviews. Uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, we've got one from the audience, but I'm just going to finish off my question. So, sure. the technique, when you have a lateral wall blowout, how do you actually get that reduced percutaneously? Do you just squeeze it together? So, well, what tends to happen uh, when you've got a short and wide uh, calcaneus, when you uh, lift up the articular fragment that's depressed, you also increase the length and you get some degree of ligamentotaxis by increasing the length, it makes the heel less wide as well. So you, you do get some improvements in uh, the, uh, the, the width of the heel. Um, I've, I've read about some uh, ancient practices where uh, for calcaneal fractures, they were hit with a hammer and I, I I hope that doesn't happen anymore. Okay, we've got a question from the audience. Would use of arthroscopy change your mind regarding uh, amount of apparent cartilage damage? Okay, so what I think they're trying to say is if you scope the joint and you find there's a lot of chondrolysis, would you proceed with uh, fixation uh, or would you go for fusion? I suspect. Uh, is, that, is that correct? Uh, would, that, would that be something you would uh, look at and counsel your patient accordingly for you? Well... The, the, the problem with uh, chondrolysis is that very often it occurs later on. It's not something that you can see immediately. When you look at the joint, all you can see is the split in the cartilage uh, with your scope. So it's not really the right time to be making a, a decision because it, it looks perfectly normal at the time. Um, and because uh, Chen has found that the rate of arthrodesis is so low, I'd be very tempted to give the patient the benefit um, with an extended lateral approach, the, there are high risks involved. With the keyhole techniques, really there's, the, the risks are a lot less significant for the patient and you're not going to end up with a soft, you're not really burning any bridges. Um, so you're going to be putting in percutaneous screws, which can be removed fairly easily as well. So 
it means that your it might make your subtalar fusion a lot easier in the future if you ever need to do that. But I'm quite hopeful that the rates of subtalar fusion are going to be low Fantastic. anyway. Great. Thank you very much for that talk. Just to round up for the audience, we've got uh, we're coming close to the end of our foot and ankle team at Fort Ninja. Next week we're going to be doing uh, mobile flat feet management or surgical management of uh, flexible flat feet. Following that. We're going to be uh, handing over the bat, uh, baton to the uh, knee surgeons. The knee surgeons are going to be coming into Orpha Ninja. They're going to be taking over uh, and going to be talking about uh, all things related to the knee. So watch that space. We're going to be sending out the uh, links to the uh, knee uh, module coming up soon. But we hope to see you next week with Flatbeat. Amir, thank you very much. Thanks, Rahim. Bye-bye.